Another disappointing series loss for the Seattle Mariners. This marks six series in a row that they have dropped. This time it was against the Toronto Blue Jays with their fans packing the house at T-Mobile Park in Seattle. The Seattle Mariners currently are first place in the AL West ever so slightly. They have a two game lead on the Houston Astros currently. If you think back to three weeks ago, they had a 10 game lead above the Astros and the Rangers. Again, now they just have a two game lead above the Astros, a six game lead above the Rangers. The Seattle Mariners offense truly is at a low point in the season. As Joe Doyle states out here in yesterday's game against the Blue Jays, they had 14 plate appearances from the seventh inning and on with runners in scoring position over those four innings and they did not score a single run. Yes, if Luke Rayleigh's double did not go over the wall and instead stayed in the park, Cal Raleigh likely would have scored and won the Mariners the game, but you really can't give the benefit of the doubt to this team that has consistently shown that their offense is bottom of the barrel. The Seattle Mariners are striking out at a historic pace. They are striking out 28.2% of the time, which if the season ended today, that would be the highest strikeout rate of any team in history. And again, this comes after the prior offseason in which they retooled their offense to reduce the strikeouts. They didn't extend Teoscar Hernandez a qualifying offer for that exact reason. They traded Jared Kelnick. They traded Eugenio Suarez, three of the guys with the highest strikeout rates in the league. They instead bring in Mitch Garver, Jorge Polanco, and others, and they still have the same problem. They already fired Brant Brown, who is the offensive coordinator that they hired to supposedly retool this offense and create a different strategy around scoring runs. Well, they are 27th in total runs scored so far this year in baseball. They are 28th in OPS, on base plus slugging. They are dead last in batting average, and they are first overall in strikeouts and by a wide margin. There is the overall fact that the Mariners have a poor offense this year. There's the fact that the guys that they have brought in through free agency and trades are yet again performing below their career norms, which doesn't make any sense. And then there's the general coaching decisions that have happened throughout the games. A few weeks ago during the Marlins series, Ryan Bliss was on an absolute heater. In a certain game, he was three for three on the day. But because there was a right-handed pitcher late in the game, Scott Service decided to go to Dominic Canzone to pinch hit for Ryan Bliss. And then in this Blue Jays series, yet again because of handiness, Scott Service decides to go to the bench in Jorge Polanco, a guy who right now could not hit water if he fell out of a boat, to replace Josh Rojas late in a game because there was a lefty on the mound. Ultimately, yes, it does fall on the players to perform when they have their opportunities, but some of those coaching decisions at the same time are questionable at best. Some of these decisions are bringing flashbacks of a certain playoff game in 2022 in which Robbie Ray was brought in to close out a game against a left-handed hitter that destroys left-handed pitchers. All that being said, the Mariners are going to be making some changes this month. I don't know exactly which direction they're gonna be going in, but they're gonna make some significant moves because a lot needs to happen in order to turn their ship around. And if big moves aren't made, then the fan base will be very upset. Speaking of which, Harry Ford. Let's talk about Harry Ford. The other day, he played a position other than catcher for the first time in his professional career. He played left field. He was drilling for a few weeks before making this start for the AA Arkansas Travelers. I made a video yesterday stating that this move is kind of showing that the Mariners are preparing to trade Harry Ford, that they're showing other teams that he can play other positions, not just catcher, that he is versatile in the field. And I believe this is the case for a couple reasons. First off, Cal Raleigh is the catcher for the Seattle Mariners of the present and the future. I do think that they will give him the bag and that they will extend him at some point. He is represented by Boris Corp, so the negotiating might be a little tougher, but Cal wants to stay in Seattle. He is a true leader of this team. There are his stats on the field which show that he is one of the best catchers in baseball and that he will be for a long time. He is the, the most clutch hitter on the Mariners so far this year and really over the span that he has been on the team. Then there is, is his clubhouse impact. Clearly he is the leader on the team right now. He's able to manage that entire pitching staff and really bring the, the best out of those guys. And I imagine that he is one of the most vocal guys in the clubhouse right now. Part two of this argument of Harry Ford is that I don't think that the Mariners are looking to move him to the outfield to bring him up to the major league roster right now. The Mariners are having to face some big decisions, including if they're gonna be designating for assignment Mitch Hanniger, Jorge Polanco, what they're gonna be doing with other guys. I don't think they're planning to bring up Harry Ford and have him play left field for the Seattle Mariners tomorrow. 
He's batting 253 with a 757 OPS, five home runs, 21 stolen bases for AA Arkansas. We've seen top prospects such as Jackson Holiday and others come up and struggle. There have been some top prospects that have come up and thrived, including Jackson Merrill for the Padres, who was an all-star this year. But with the current state of the Mariners offense, you cannot be relying on prospects to come up and perform for their offense right now. With Harry Ford being the Mariners number two overall prospect, according to MLB.com, the 23rd overall prospect in all of baseball at the moment, the amount of impact that the Mariners are going to have to bring in at this deadline will require top prospects such as Harry Ford and others. You could make the argument that it makes more sense for the Mariners to keep Harry Ford and trade some of their other prospects, specifically up the middle of the infield. You've got Colt Emerson, Cole Young, Ty Pete, Felnine Celestine, all these guys that could play shortstop, second base, third base. You have a surplus up the middle of the field. A top catching prospect is very rare and a guy like Harry Ford is more rare than some of those other guys that I just mentioned. And if the Mariners do end up trading Harry Ford, then you have to assume that the Mariners are going to be locking up Cal Raleigh for the long term and that they're going to pay him what he's asking for. And with the Seattle Mariners having one of the best pitching staffs in all of baseball, certainly one of the best starting rotations in all of baseball, they have a lot of guys that are on cheap, inexpensive pre-arbitration deals that will be heading into arbitration and those contracts will be exponentially more over the coming years. The time to win for the Mariners is right now, especially if they have the payroll restraints that has been made public over the past couple years. So whether or not the Mariners decide to trade Harry Ford or not will be a big tell on what they plan for the future of this franchise in with Cal Raleigh, with the starting pitchers, with who they decide to have up the middle of their infield in the coming years, which top prospects will actually make an impact on this big league roster. There really are no untouchable prospects at this point. You could see Cole Young, you could even see Colt Emerson, you could see Ty Pete, Johnny Farmello, Felnine Celestine, all, these, all of these guys could potentially be on the move at this deadline. However, if you're trading some of those top prospects away, I would imagine the Mariners will be targeting guys with a few years of control left. Lag Guerrero Jr. has just one and a half years of control left. That would be tough to give away a Colt Emerson or a Harry Ford for just one and a half years of a guy. Separate from Harry Ford, there's an update with Logan Evans, who is one of the Mariners' top starting pitching prospects. He was moved to the bullpen as potentially a fill-in for some of these injuries that the Mariners have seen. They saw Matt Brash go down, Jackson Kowar, Gregory Santos is just now about to make his season debut for the Mariners. Logan Evans was moved to the bullpen for about a month to see if he could potentially have an impact on the big league roster sooner rather than later. As a reliever, he pitched in 10 games. There was 46 plate appearances and his stuff did not play up nearly as much as the Mariners front office might have expected. As a starter so far this year in 2024 at AA Arkansas, he was allowing a 198 batting average against just a 563 OPS. However, when he was moved to the bullpen, he was giving up much more production. He was allowing a 263 batting average against a 716 OPS. And in a subsequent move at the start of July, they have decided to move Logan Evans back to the rotation. This could be for a multitude of reasons. As I just mentioned, his production went down when he went to the bullpen. That could be one part of it. A second part of it is that the Mariners very well might need Logan Evans as a starting pitcher at some point this year, depending on what they do with Emerson Hancock. Emerson has been a key piece for the Mariners so far this year to come up and be that fifth starter whenever they've needed him, when Brian Wu has been injured. He had his own brief injury stint in which he was removed from a game with lower back tightness. But outside of Emerson Hancock, there really is no starting rotation depth outside of Logan Evans. So if Emerson Hancock were to go down while Brian Wu was down, they would have to rely on spot starts from various guys. It might make more sense to have Logan Evans come up and fill in that role if needed. On the same note, Emerson Hancock will be asked about by teams at the trade deadline. If the Mariners are looking to reduce the overall prospect capital it might take to bring in some of these offensive reinforcements, if they don't want to get rid of all of those bats in their system, they could look at trading Emerson Hancock, although that is a very small likelihood because you really need pitching and you need that depth and Emerson Hancock has been solid for the Mariners. That all being said, the MLB trade deadline is July 30th at 6 p.m. Eastern time. That is just over three weeks from today. The Mariners are set to play two games at the San Diego Padres and then four games at the Angels before breaking for the All-Star break. The Mariners will get right into it the second half of the season. They have three games against the Astros at home. And if you look at tankathon.com, which ranks the remaining strength of schedule for each team, Fortunately, it ranks the Mariners as having the second easiest strength of schedule the rest of the season. 
Before heading into that series against the Padres, the Mariners' opponents the rest of the year have a 478 combined winning percentage. So their remaining strength of schedule is on their side. Gregory Santos just got activated from the injured list, and fans can only hope that the Mariners' players will turn it around in the second half, as well as the front office bringing in some reinforcements to help push the Mariners back into the playoffs and hopefully win the AL West for the first time since 2001. Let me know in the comments below who you think the Mariners should trade for, who you think they should trade away, and otherwise make sure to like and subscribe and check out this video right here.